Hello, everybody. My name is Ben Gramico. I'm from Internachi, and this is the home inspection training class number 10. And we're going to start in about five minutes, as you can see on my timer. Class officially starts in about five minutes. We had nearly 900 registered students for the class. Um, Internachi is the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors the world's largest organization of residential and commercial property inspectors. We essentially train and certify inspectors all over the world. And every month, we do a live, free, online class that you're attending today. If you are watching this as a recording, a video recording on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, or on some other channel, um, great. But we do live classes, so you miss the live class. And you can contact me if you'd like to attend the next class. And there's my name and our contact page. There's my name, Ben Gramico. And you go to nachi.org forward slash contact. And so, again, we're going to start in about four minutes. We had nearly 900 students registered for the class. And while I have you, um, before we do a home inspection on this house, I'll take you to a couple pages. Good morning, Kent, Bruce. Hope you all can hear me. Um, we're going to start in just a few minutes. We had nearly 900 students register, so we're going to give them plenty of time to um, come to class. But while I have you, and before we inspect this house, um, I don't know if you've been here before, but go to natchiorg forward slash everything. And there we have a web page that has everything, all you need, all in one place, right? Everything you need, all in one place. And play this little video at the top. But it's essentially a step-by-step -step checklist that you can follow it's for building and operating a successful home inspection business. And it actually provides its members not only online training and certifications, but also marketing services, business courses, and support. And so this is a step-by-step -step checklist. First step is join InterNACHI and become a member of InterNACHI. And as soon as you do that, a whole world of opportunity opens up to you. Because as a member, you have unlimited access to all of our online training at no additional cost, just the membership fee. And when you're ready, because you learn at your own pace, you can become certified. A certified home inspector, a certified home energy inspector, a certified energy auditor, a certified mold tester, a certified radon tester. You get the idea. InterNACHI has over 30 certifi certification programs available to all of our members. They're all online, and they're all free. So you join InterNACHI is step one, and then you keep going down the checklist. Step two, get certified. Step three, you work on your branding and marketing. And InterNACHI has a marketing team of very young, talented illustrators and designers and professionals who will work one-on-one -on -one with you to develop your brand. Even if you're a veteran, you should always improve the message of why you should be hired over anyone else. If you're new, this is critical. You have to figure out what makes you different from all the rest and why you charge your, your fees, why you charge what you charge. What is the value that you bring? That's your brand. And then marketing, we help you with the marketing with your business cards, your logos, um, your flyers, your website, and all that design work is free for our members. All that consultation and branding and marketing is free for our members. The marketing is the stuff that you use to get that message out, to get your brand out. And it should be uniform and professional, and you can't do it at home. And so you go to this page here in step three, there's a little video about what we do for our members. We have a home inspection business course. 
first one of its kind. It's really robust. We break down what it takes to run a successful home inspection business into 17 easy steps. Many inspectors are technically great at doing home inspections because there's so many training opportunities available. But they're really bad at marketing and at business. There's really three aspects there, right? And so um, you have to be strong in all three. The technical aspects of doing a home inspection, the marketing, the branding and marketing, and the business. And InterNACHI, again, provides everything you need. So go down that checklist. And that's at nachi.org forward slash everything. And we're going to start real soon. There we go. There's the timer. And we're going to do a home inspection according to the standards of practice. And the international residential standards of practice for performing a general home inspection is at this web page, nachi.org forward slash SOP. And we have people logging in. Um, South Carpa. Gerald is from South Carpa. What state or province is South Carpa? Um, we have people from all over the world, actually. Um, here's Daryl from Indiana, Rich from Florida, um, Mike from Georgia, Americus, Georgia. I've never been there. I'm sure it's a beautiful place. Welcome, everyone. My name is Ben Gramico. I'm from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. This is a live, free, online class, home inspection training class, number 10. Um, that's my name. There's our contact page. And on our contact page, you'll see our entire staff. Um, and you can contact any, anyone um, if, uh, and we all work together in the same big warehouse, same big office space. So call one of us, and we can literally take the phone to anyone else you want to talk to. And we're going to do a home inspection on this house. And what I do is I follow the standards of practice. And that guides my inspection. Many inspectors start, let's say, in the kitchen. Some start on the roof. I start on the roof. Whatever you do, do the same process. So the standards of practice, I use as a guide. Whatever system I'm inspecting, let's say I start with the roof, go to the standards of practice, and you figure out what are you required to inspect, or what, are you, what are you not required to inspect. And then you um, develop a software program, and buy a software program, Go to our e-commerce partner, Inspector Outlet. They have discounts for members. And you buy a software, and you create a template, a home inspection template, general home inspection template, according to the standards, all the systems in there. And you can develop a, a checklist to guide your inspection. I recommend a, a mobile device so that you can write your report as you do the inspection. And it could be system by system, or room by room, or a combination. And we'll do a combination of things today. We'll, We'll inspect systems according to the standards of practice and also rooms um, according to the standards of practice. So I get up on the roof. I'm trained to get up on the roof. I follow state safety best practices to get up on the roof. I've built homes. I've installed roofs. I've been on roofs for many years. I know what I'm doing. If you are not qualified to do so, you're not required to step up on any roof according to the standards of practice. You're not required to walk upon any roof surface, even if it's flat. So how do you inspect a roof? From the ground. You can inspect the roof from the ground and use your eyes. Use binoculars, or you, you can use a spectroscope. This is a tool invented in partnership with InterNACHI Inspector Outlet. It's an extended pole with a camera on the top of the pole that extends 35 feet in the air very light, Wi-Fi connection to a mobile device, any kind of device, iPad, iPhone, Droid, and you can take pictures. You can inspect the roof from the ground safely. So um, before I say Inspector Outlet one more time, why don't we just show you Inspector Outlet. If you're going to buy any tools for your inspection business, this is where you shop. Don't go anywhere else. And it's inspectoroutlet.com. 
And let me show you a few tools. Here's, we have, there are infrared cameras. Um, this one is um, for your iPhone. Snap it on your iPhone, a few hundred bucks. It's from FLIR. Um, this is a fantastic um, flashlight, a lot of lumens. And it has a neutral white tint so that the colors come out really well with your photographs. This is from Inspector Outlet. We're going to do a crawl space inspection today. So these are crawl space gloves. Inspector Outlet sells these crawl space gloves. And um, they, they are gloves that go all the way up to your elbow, past your elbow. So you can crawl in the crawl space. And um, really nice fingers. And also to protect your client's home. Um, booties, obviously GFCI, tester, inspector outlet sells moisture meters. I like the Tramex one. There's another moisture meter here. For attics and crawl spaces, you need a headlamp. These are all fantastic home inspector tools. Um, a tick tracer, a microwave detector. Stick that in the microwave with a glass of water. All those inspector tools come from our e-commerce partner. We work elbow to elbow, literally. So if you need help with your tools, what tools do you need? You can call me, um, anyone at InterNACHI, and anyone at Inspector Outlet. Inspector Outlet is InterNACHI's e-commerce partner, and they recognize members of InterNACHI and provide exclusive discounts to members of InterNACHI. Don't go anywhere else. I get up on the roof. I bring 40-foot aluminum ladders, 28-foot fiberglass ladders, 12-foot aluminum step ladders, and crawl gear. So I go from the very top to the very bottom, and I take a lot of pictures. By the time I'm done inspecting the roof, I've taken maybe 150 pictures of the gutters. There's a bit of a bump in the soffit. Kind of like a trim problem, not a big structural problem, really cosmetic. But I like to note these things, even the cosmetic stuff. And the shingles here are in pretty good shape for the age of the house, about 12 years old estimate. You don't have to estimate the age, but I like to give a ballpark idea of where this roof is in condition. And the roof. Covering materials look in great shape. So I'm, bon up, I'm up on my ladder, up on a gutter's edge. It's a little slippery, so I'm not going up on the roof. You're not required to. But I'm looking for anything cracked, damaged, curled, missing, anything at all, any patching. And I'm also looking at anything that penetrates the roof. And that includes a chimney, a vent pipe, skylight, maybe something attached to the top of the roof covering. Um, a satellite dish, they always have the screws going right through the materials. I'm looking at the chimney. I can't get up to it. I like to touch the top of the chimney, see the cap, see the top. But I do my best zooming in with the digital images. And I'll tell you what, uh, you don't have to. I set my camera to the lowest resolution. So I have a digital camera. I actually have two. I carry two, one for digital pictures, one for video. We can talk about that later. I'd shoot video on every inspection. So my digital camera, I set it to the lowest resolution. I'm not printing a book. I don't need high res. Uh, low res images that are um, anywhere from like 100 to 200 kilobytes. Kilobytes, K with a K, not megabytes, kilobytes. Um, 480 by 360. And they're easy to manage. When you shoot 500 digital pictures for every inspection, it's easy to manage that. It's like a couple megabytes of information. Now you can put that on a USB. Now you can upload it to um, a website that you can share your images with your clients. Um, you could upload something quickly to Facebook to share, um, non-confidential uh, image. Um, so low res, OK? That's what I recommend. And here are some missing, f missing kick out. I know it's brick uh, face, but I want to see a kick out. And uh, there's loose flashing there. And while up on my ladder um, and coming down my ladder, I'm going to take a look at other components, like 
different materials, where different materials touch. So I'm basically done with the roof inspection. Coming down my ladder, I'm looking at the siding where the window meets the brick. I want a nice good seal. Don't want any open gaps for water intrusion. Um, this is the money shot, so I make sure that this is part of my brand. I put a picture like this in every inspection report, which is essentially a big marketing card, a business card. Your inspection report is really important. You should be working on improving your inspection report every day. At the end of every day, you should be improving your narratives and how you write the report and getting faster and adding more photos and videos into your report because everybody looks at your inspection report and determines if they should hire you or not for the next inspection. And if they see that you do something like this, well, this was part of my brand. I beat a ton of my competition in my area, which was uh, for 13 years, Southeast PA near Philly, about 300 inspectors in my local 20 mile radius area. And you beat most of them if you do something that no one else does and you provide that as value to your inspection. And so this is what I did. I was qualified to do roof inspections, carry big ladders, and I made sure everybody knew it. It's part of my brand. There's missing kickout flashing. Um, if you're looking at from the ground, you won't be able to see it. If you are using a spectroscope, you will be able to see it. If you're on your ladder, you could see it. Um, and there's some indications of a missing kickout flashing. Kickout flashing is essentially a bent piece of metal where the gutter end butts up against the siding or the chimney. So it's supposed to kick water out away from the siding material and into the gutter. If it's missing, then it tends to find its way through openings right at that flashing area, right at that critical area. And so we have a, a non-masonry chimney. I know because it's stucco. So we have stucco, hard coat stucco, applied to plywood. Um, maybe there's a drainage plane, maybe not. And now we have a moisture intrusion point and indications of moisture intrusion and a missing flashing piece called a kick-up. So I have to keep that in mind while I'm doing the rest of my inspection because I know that a house is a system of interdependent parts. That means many systems are working together. If you affect one system, you affect many others, maybe all others. If it's the heating system, the lungs of the house, heating cooling system, it could be anywhere from indoor air quality to hazards. Um, so uh, think you have to, while you're inspecting, you have to think of other systems and components and how they affect one another. So I'm going to keep this in mind as we do this inspection. Now I'm down on the ground. And I use a mobile device to write my reports so that I, I, I don't forget anything. So I come down off my ladder and I stop inspecting and I write my inspection report about the house roof system. And when I'm done with that, I'm done with that system. When I start, before I start my exterior inspection, I go counterclockwise all the time. Before I start my exterior inspection, I'm done with the roof. I don't like to work at home or at the office. So when I'm done, I'm done with that roof system. That speeds you up. So I highly recommend going to Inspector Outlet and look at all the software that we have available for you with exclusive discounts for InterNACHI members and non-members. Um, so what I th also think about is um, how water moves. So I think about how water hits the roof, diverted away, caught possibly in gutters, directed by downspouts, and diverted away from the foundation. So we have a, you know, a, a splash block here it's not very long, it's not extended very far. I like to see it six feet. Um, maybe something underground discharging away. Um, this, this, this pipe here is probably dumping hundreds of gallons of water in one spot during a heavy rainstorm. And it's all about your climate too. So this is Pennsylvania. We call it Pennsylvania because it rains all the time. 
And there's a, an illustration to help communicate what you're trying to communicate to your clients about water, getting water off the roof, down the siding, and away from the house. And these illustrations are available to members for free, and they're online and in high res. So if you go to our Internet Inspection Graphics Library, um, you can browse through, and we have, oh, thousands of really nice illustrations. Just a couple examples here. So we'll be in a crawl space later on in about half an hour. And so you can download those pictures into your inspection report. So let's get to the exterior. Well, let me tell you what, what my brand is. My brand is to get to the property at least a half hour to 15 minutes prior to anybody else. I knock on the door, see if it's occupied. I explain who I am, why I'm here. Um, if no one is there, then this is probably one of the most important tools that I use. It's a, a t-shirt that shows that I'm InterNACHI certified and that I am an InterNACHI certified inspector. Because when I'm walking around, maybe the neighbors might be looking out. Good neighbors look out for each other. And they may see some strange guy snooping around the exterior of this house. Well, I want to make sure I identify myself. I don't put my home inspection business on my t-shirt. I make sure everybody knows that I'm an inspector. Don't, don't shoot. Okay, so that's a really important tool. You can get those t-shirts from Inspector Outlet as well. And so I'm on the roof. And when my clients come, pull up in the driveway with their real estate agent or representative, I wave to them from the roof. And I want to demonstrate to them that they have hired the right inspector because I get up on the roof. Maybe you don't. That's okay. But that was my brand and my message on every inspection. And when I came down, big smile, nice handshake, and pass out a ton of business cards and explain to them the inspection process. This will be the first time you'll see your client. So smile. We have actually a customer service and communications course for home inspectors to tune your um, communication skills. And then I explain to them that I've done the roof. I tell them my observations. And then I tell them, well, let's go around the exterior one loop. I ask them if they want to. They don't have to. I like them to be with me. We go around the exterior one time. I push them inside, tell them to go measure something, go look at windows, take a look at things. It's their time to look at the house while I do another loop around the exterior in detail, taking pictures, writing my inspection report. Um, to give you an idea of what you are required to inspect, so what am I required to inspect on the outside? It's very easy. You just follow the standards of practice. And so here they are. Here's the standards of practice. Um, here are the categories. And I want to go to exterior. That's 3.2. And I'm required to inspect, boom, all these. And I'm required to describe the exterior wall coverings. And I'm required to report this, spindles and rails. Why that? Well, a lot of children get hurt. And code tends to change. Building codes tend to change after somebody gets hurt. Essentially, that's, that's what codes are, to help um, standardize best building practices and also help the occupants from hazards. So um, code's important. Standards are important. Best practices are important. And following the standards of practice for performing a home inspection is important. And knowing what you are required to inspect and not required to inspect. Now I'm doing exterior drainage. I'm looking for flat surfaces. I want some slope around the perimeter of the foundation to drain that water away. Um, and uh, just to make sure, I want to make sure everyone is good. It looks like all of our students are good. Patrick says it's glitching on my end. Uh, Ron says the stream is freezing. Um, just log out and log back in. That tends to be what you have to do. Uh, if you're using um, uh, Windows or um, uh, Internet Explorer, couldn't think of it. Um, we get bad feedback from Internet Explorer. We get great feedback from using a browser called Firefox and Chrome. Those tend to be 
um, really good. Okay, so um, looking for water puddles. I'm looking for um, impervious surfaces, um, hard surfaces that push water away, essentially direct water. I want it all sloped away, even the sidewalks, front stoops, steps, stairs, porches, decks. I'm looking at the siding materials, and I'm also taking pictures, as you can tell. I mean, this picture says a lot, right? Like, I can't see everything. And I actually tell my clients that. Orally, when I see them, verbally in my written report, I communicate that I can't see everything. That's not my job, actually, to see everything that's visible. So, taking pictures of all the siding, and then I start to do components. I start to move in to the house a little closer, and I look at doors and windows. And when I look at a window and a door, it's basically the same thing. It's a square opening through the building envelope. I want to look top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. And I'm looking for water intrusion points, water damage, and anything that isn't diverting water away, shedding water away. That's what, a, that's what protection from a structure does. It keeps you warm, keeps you comfortable inside, protects you, and it sheds away things. So I think about water all the time. In fact, a great home inspector is actually a really good moisture inspector. And we have a moisture course. Um, because it's really important to understand how moisture penetrates into a house. The ways that moisture and energy move into a house is important to understand. So these are components. And I'm testing these exterior receptacles with um, GFCI tester that I get from Inspector Outlet, right? You can get it from any hardware store, though. And I'm looking for open gaps where different materials are touching each other. They tend to expand and contract at different rates. There's an opening there. Not sure what that vent is. I really don't like the louvered vents. Um, I really don't like them on dryer vents. So this is a bathroom fan. And I think it's blowing out sideways, as you can tell. It's going out um, this way and that way. I think these are stuck, and I can't reach it. Um, and so this is a sump pump discharge pipe. So now I'm looking at things, components on the exterior, and I have to relate them to com systems or components connected to it on the interior. And this, I'm assuming, is a sump pump, which is what I really like. I like that clean out fitting there at the T, at the Y. And a uh, frost-free hose bib on the outside, a water spigot. And there's a Right below it is a big hole, a deep hole, that could allow water to collect, maybe about a foot of water to collect and pool right next to the foundation. That isn't good. Um, I know what this is, but if you don't know what something is, tell your client, I don't know what it is, and then get on our message board with other inspectors, post the image. We show you how to post an image. It's very easy. And then ask, does anybody know what this is? And then you can get back to your client. Never say, oh, yeah, I know what this is, and make something up. It's OK to say, especially if you're new, I don't know what this is, but I guarantee you, I'm. if you give me till tomorrow, I can look it up and see what's going on. I'll even try to ask, communicate with the seller to see what it is. Another water spigot. Here's the dryer vent. Not good. Uh, it's filled with lint. It's disconnected on the inside. Right There it is there. So it's discharging into, if you do a circle, you know, it's like this. So it's discharging up here. There's a lot of lint. It's clogged. This bottom one doesn't open, right? So why don't I like that? Well, because um, I tend to look at the International Code Council. Uh, InterNACHI's training is basically based upon standards and best practices that are found in code the International Residential Code, developed and maintained by International Code Council. And the code is actually public. They made it public, a great thing that International, International Code Council did, make all their codes public. And so I go to this, and 
I know what you're saying. We're not code inspectors. Let me show you. Um, exhaust ducts shall terminate outside the building. Um, exhaust duct terminations shall be in accordance with the dryer's manufacturer's installations. Um, exhaust ducts shall not terminate less than three feet in any direction from any openings into buildings. So if there's a dryer exhaust duct and a window right next to it, that's no good. It has to be at least three feet away. Exhaust duct terminations shall be equipped with a backdraft damper. There wasn't a backdraft damper on that one at the home. Um, backdraft damper, you know, a damper. The swings back and forth. And screens shall not be installed at the duct termination. So you can consider, I do, the louvered fitting component at the end of the dryer exhaust termination as a screen. It's, it's blocking the exhaust. It should be free flowing with a damper so that nothing gets back in. So when it exhausts, the damper opens, and there's free flow of air. Otherwise, you could have a potential hazard, right? So how do I know that? Because I refer to the code. I'm not a code inspector. I don't use the word code. I don't even say standards or best practices. I just give my recommendations. Off re the report, I know about code. And I know this, too. So in the IRC 2012, um, we have this. The maximum length of the exhaust duct shall be 35 feet. So they increased it from previous years. 2006, 2009, it was 25 feet, 25 feet. It was in my head, 25 feet, 25 feet. It's now actually 35 feet because our houses in the United States are so big, right? So there's a standard that you may want to know about. So that's an example of what's available to you. And Internet, she is actually a uh, training provider. If you are a contractor um, and, he, and you are um, an international code council contractor, licensed, certified contractor, uh, you can get CE, free online CE, through InterNACHI. Let's go to the next system. If you're on the outside, you're taking a look at other systems. Here's one of them. Here's the electrical system that's on the exterior system. It's within it, right? So I don't want water penetration here. And I'm looking at the attachment. I actually grab the meter box and give it a little pull. Some pull actually right off. Don't want that. And there are inspection restrictions. I can't get to the meter. And I look at the line, service entrance line, going into the main panel in the basement. There's the underground conduit coming up from ground. There's the gas. Oh, there's the grounding wire there. I don't dig anything. I just take a picture of it. And then there's the gas meter. We have natural gas supplied to the house. Gas meters on the outside, pressure regulator, vent, shutoff valve. There's a shutoff valve there. Not too concerned about the rust, although if it gets out of hand, it will go through the threads and open it up a little bit, and we don't want that. Um, there's a standards of practice for inspecting the cooling. There's the air conditioner there. Uh, inspection restrictions, dense vegetation should be trimmed away. And there's the serial number and model number and all the other numbers. And why do I like that? Well, here's why I like it. I like to look at the model. Oh, a serial number for the year. Model number for the size. And we have a course just for that. So if you'd like to see it, let me see here. Um, let me get back to my slide. That's the code. So we have a course on how to inspect HVAC systems. We have several. This one is called Inspecting HVAC Energy Efficiency for Inspectors. If you go in there and you click, and you go to the air conditioning section, and you go up, sizing up old air conditioners, it says, look at the nameplate on the outdoor condensing unit and locate the model number, not the serial number. And you're looking for two digits in the model number that match the numbers below to indicate the tons or BTUs, and we had 42, and that means it's a three and a half ton, or 42,000 BTU per hour unit. So if you're ever looking for how do I inspect something in detail, 
um, InterNACHI has the online training courses for you to be technically great at what you do. Um, there's a service switch, a little rust on the top. Fins are OK. We have a standards of practice for heating. I identify the thermostat. It should not be manual. It should be automatic to save energy. There's a shutoff switch, emergency shutoff switch. And there's the unit itself, the HVAC unit itself. In my head, I'm still thinking about air conditioning. I'm writing on my mobile device. I'm still on the air conditioning system. So there's the coil there, front side. Refrigerant lines, large diameter, small diameter, large diameter is insulated. It's called the suction line. Small diameter, not insulated. It's called the liquid line, right? Model number, serial number. Air conditioner, um, evaporator coil. The fins should be relatively clean. It should be draining properly. It should have a trap, missing a trap. It goes into a condensate pump. This pump discharges into a sump pump. We saw the sump pump discharge pipe on the outside. If you remember, it had a clean out fitting. So all these systems, how did air conditioning get connected to the sump pump? Well, there, there, this is how you have to think. A house is a system of interdependent parts. One part affects all others. Um, the sump pump is plugged in, shut off switch, gas shut off valve, there's the unit there. So as you can tell, I take a lot of pictures of every system and almost every component. Everything I inspect, I can touch with my hand. Don't waste your time in putting arrows and circles into your report. Just use your hand. So this is the gas shutoff valve. That's the shutoff switch, service switch. So from 10 feet away, you should be able to tell me the efficiency of the heating system. If you don't, maybe you could take our course. We have a fantastic online, free for our members, video course, video-based course on how to inspect an HVAC system. And we tear apart, I would say, uh, half a dozen, maybe more systems into their parts. Every part. We take it out, show it to you, and explain how it works. So from 10 feet away, do you know the efficiency of this heating system? Not required to know. But do you know? So that you can tell your client if this is a low efficiency heating system, you're going to spend a lot of money on your heating bills every month because this is lower. Or is this mid? Or if this is it high? So it's mid. It's 80 to 85. It has several things that indicate that you can see from 10 feet away. It has a draft inducer fan. A fan that sucks air, induces a draft through the heat exchanger. It has an intermittent pilot flame. Has, I can see this one has not a glow plug, not an electric stick, but a pilot. It has a pilot light that ticks, turns on, the flame turns on, lights up, and then the in-shop burners kick on, like that. And they'll literally make those, those, those in-shop burners there. If they're not ribbon burners, that's low efficiency. In-shop burners will go <laughs> actually make a noise. And while you, after you do a thousand inspections of heating systems, you get to hear and smell and feel the system to see if it's in good shape, working properly. Why do I care what the efficiency is? Well, if it's a high efficiency unit installed on a 30, 40 year old home, I know that the ductwork probably hasn't been sealed and insulated, mastic sealed and insulated. So the ductwork throughout the house is leaking because that's how they built homes 30 years ago with ducts, no, no sealant, no mastic sealant, no insulation. So it's low efficiency duct, the, the ductwork is bleeding energy and we put a high efficiency or mid efficiency system on there. Well, it's not really a high efficiency heating system if the ducts are bleeding. So you may tell your client, this is a high efficiency heating system, congratulations. But actually, it's losing energy 20%, could, up to 25% through the ducts. They're bleeding energy. That bleeds money. It's not really a high efficiency heating system. Could be a high efficiency 
heater unit. Yeah. Um, and then I open up the panels. I check the safety switch to get to the air filter, just like a, a homeowner should do, regular routine maintenance things. You should follow the path of any homeowner maintenance routine. To get to the air filter, a bit difficult. Pull it out. Take a picture. I like to take a picture of the size and the direction of the air filter. There's the in-shop burners. Pilot. Flue connection going up into the attic. Take a picture of all the labels. Get to the plumbing. Clean out is required. Drain waste vent pipes in this ceiling of the basement, unfinished basement. So I get to see uh, for proper slope, proper support, any water leaks. So I think of water going out. Now I think of water coming in, supply. Ball shutoff valve, better than a, any other kind of valve. Uh, jumper cable. There's a check valve. Check valve stops water from your house, potable water, from going back to the street through the meter. Um, it stops contaminating also. It doesn't prevent, if you're working on something in your house, it doesn't allow that contaminated water that you didn't flush yet um, to go back into the system. So there's a check valve. Can't go back. Now you hook up a hot water tank to the system within the house, right? Water expands. Where's that expansion going to go if there's a check valve? That's no good. You need a pressure relief valve to relieve that pressure, or you need an expansion tank to relieve the pressure. So on top of that, what, when I see a check valve, I want to see an expansion tank. I want to see it properly installed as well. Yeah? And we have a course about hot water tanks as well. Um, there's a pressure relief valve on the tank, and it's dripping. And I am assuming, based upon my observations, that it's because of a pressure situation. Uh, there's the uh, temperature gauge. Uh, I take a picture of the label. A lot of information there. Shut off valve on a cold water, hot water tank. Uh, what's at the bottom of modern hot water tanks? There's a system called FBIR, a Flammable Vapor Ignition Resistant System. It's basically just a screen that controls the flow of gases. It doesn't go in, right? And if you don't know what I'm talking about, well, guess what Internet she has? You got it. How to inspect a hot water heater course. It's a really great video course. Uh, we got a master plumber. And we actually um, cut open electric hot water tanks and gas hot water tanks, and we look at every system and component, uh, every component of the water heater system, including the FVIR. Uh, back to our slides. So I'm going to go a little faster because um, we should be moving along a little bit faster. Um, oh. Uh, Abel uh, from South Africa is listening in. Thanks, Abel. Um, Brian, you were right. It appears to be mid. Very good. All right. Um, just making sure that um, um, people are asking questions to each other. You can, you can um, ask questions to each other and to me. Um, if there are any non-members, out there, I'd like to offer you a 50% discount off your first year membership. So an entire year, 50% off your first year, and this is for non-members only. If you're a member, well, you're already a member. <laughs> Can't take advantage of it. So this is a 50% off, 50 discount off your first year membership to InterNACHI. And to receive your 50% discount off your first year membership to InterNACHI, for non-members only, click that button saying, I'm interested in. You enter your credit card information. Last page is the discount. And um, there you go. So you have um, one hour from now. And we're giving away 20 of these. So I'll leave that up. That's a little pop-up that you should see. Um, there's two buttons at the top there to chat and little pop-ins offers. All right, so we're back, and now we're at the electrical panel. There's a standards of practice that helps you guide your inspection of the electrical system. 
Um, I like to take a lot of pictures. Two fingers means 200 amps. One and a half means 150. One finger means 100. If it's 60 amps, well, that's a defect and it really needs to be changed out. Um, I like to take a look at all the breakers, make sure that they are on. If there's any off, turned off or tripped off, I like to take a picture of that and identify it. Make sure that I didn't do anything after I remove the panel and I remove the panel and you're not required to do that. I removed the dead front cover, have for 13 years, just used to it, trained by it. If you are not required to, don't do it. Number one rule is stay safe. You're not required to go up on a roof, don't. You're not required to take the front dead cover off, don't. If you're gonna do anything, use safety equipment, personal protection. I wear goggles, gloves, I use tick tracers, and that there isn't a whole lot of high voltage in home inspections, but still, um, could be a spark, could be something in there, an arc, who knows, a flash. I also take pictures of permits. If I have a finished basement, I want to make sure that I know that that was permitted or not. Take a look at the lines. There's the doorbell ringer. There's the cable. There's the cover off. Now I'm looking for anything that shouldn't be there over fusing a large amp breaker on a small gauge wire, um, melting, rust, um, a mouse, debris, paint. So I'm looking at all the, I didn't see anything in this panel. Looks really good. And now the structure. The structure looks really good too. Unfinished basement. This house is doing really well. I mean, it's, we haven't really came across anything. Have we come across any major material defects? No. Looking good, pour con concrete. Looks like they've had some water in the past. Um, those watermarks are on top of the um, patch around the main drain line. So that happened after it was patched. So I'm kind of concerned about that. Maybe during a heavy rainstorm, maybe this is after it was just built, I don't know. Um, you could use a moisture meter. You can use uh, an infrared to help you see something more to help you see anomalies. Not quantified, I could care less what the moisture level is or the content or, the, I'm just looking for, I'm just trying to qualify it, looking for anomalies. Not here to measure anything or test anything or diagnose anything. So there's another patch there and there's some water marks on the, on the so I'm gonna call this out. There's probably some need for some epoxy. Um, injection right there. And the epoxy, the strength of the epoxy that you inject to seal up a crack is actually stronger than the concrete itself. So it's a really amazing material. And there's the floor joist. Oh, it looks pretty good. And you can see there's insulation at the band rim joist. And so what I do is um, I go beyond the standards of practice for every home. And um, I use a, a gardening tool. It's called a, a hoe, a three-tine hoe. There's three fingers, three tines. One's straight, one's bent a little bit, and one's really hooked. And I stick it up in there. It's extendable. And I move insulation back and forth. I take a random, like I'm inspecting windows, a random number of uh, bays. I inspect, move the insulation, put it right back. No one knows I was there. And sometimes I come across this. I move the insulation, and it falls down, and it's wet, and it smells bad, and there's black stuff and there's watermarks and it is wet. I, don't, I can just touch it. It's a great tool. You just touch it. It's a great moisture meter. Use your hand, touch it. It's right underneath the fireplace. I run upstairs. I go to the fireplace, factory built fireplace. The panels look good. Nothing cracked. I don't see any rust. I don't see any watermarks. Damper opens and closes. Looks okay. Come back down. Now I'm looking for what is causing the water. Uh, the kickout flashing. Remember the kickout flashing a long time ago, about 43 minutes ago? We saw a missing piece of kickout flashing from the roof, second story roof, where the gutter end met the side of the chimney. And it's leaking. That water from 30 feet up in the air is leaking down the inside of the wood chimney structure deteriorating everything, coming through the attic, through the second floor, through the first floor, and down into the basement at the top of the foundation wall. 
if it's rotten here, that's my screwdriver through the structural load bearing component of the home, the floor joist. If it's rotten down here, imagine what the chimney stack is like. I'll probably push it over. So rotten. If it's rotten down here, it's probably rotten all the way up between the two points. Now I'm looking like crazy at all the other areas, maybe under the slider door, maybe under the entry door, maybe under some windows. So I'm moving around, not really finding anything additional other than the chimney. So moisture, problem, material defect, major problem. Um, some pump has a discharge and a, a plug and a check valve. Smoke detectors work. I'm going in the attic. Trust built. When it's trust built, I think modifications after it was installed. It's the easy, easy structural defect to find. I'm looking for anything that was cut or modified afterwards. And I'm looking for roof leaks. And this is blown in insulation, so um, I can see watermarks. If I see water drops, it could be a roof leak or it could be um, a condensation problem, um, warm, moist air in an attic, and um, the nails, roofing nails or dripping water, things like that. Uh, I take pictures of everything. Closets, I'm in a closet here, master bedroom closet. I'm looking at windows, ceiling fans, hallways, windows, wall receptacles, um, tilting the windows, the type of windows, the doors, the trim, the switches, looking underneath carpeting. You don't have to pull up carpeting, but I take a look, especially at the door, entry door. Sometimes there's some fun stuff there. Taking a look at the railings. I'm on the first floor now. Just a lot of interior stuff. And I'm looking at the ceiling of the first floor, making sh underneath the, the bathrooms of the second floor, making sure there aren't any indications of anything strange. And infrared really helps you out. There's even a little hatch in a closet somewhere. Um, and it's missing some insulation, actually. So the bathrooms. So everything else up to this point was really in a system, according to the standards of practice. In the standards of practice, there aren't any bathroom section, right? So what I do is I make my report um, switch from systems to now rooms, bathrooms. I group all the bathrooms together. Just seemed to be easier for me. So I flush all the toilets, and I take a, all the tubs and the showers, and I take a lot of pictures. I pound on the walls in the shower and the tile to see if there's any problems there, soft tiles, backing, um, open grout lines. And I'm looking at the flow, and I, I direct the shower head to the, the walls and the corners to see if it leaks, making sure that the hot is on the right. And Oh, no, the hot is on the left. Cold is on the right. Looking at the, looking for P traps, S traps, um, and then flow. So there's very little flow when I turn on the shower and the sink and flush the toilet at the same time. So there's something wrong there. Could be a pressure problem. Remember our pressure check valve expansion tank issue downstairs? Um, GFCIs in all bathrooms. Um, there's the fan. Remember exhausted on the outside. There's more bathroom stuff. Same pressure problem. I like plumbing access panels right where the shower drain is and the valves should be. I'd love to open them up. If there isn't a plumbing access panel, I actually make um, a recommendation that it should be installed. Laundry is another one. Laundry, I group everything in the laundry room together, including the dryer vent. There's a gas supply, gas shutoff valve. Um, the hoses should be replaced. I like to see pressure-tested hoses. And there's no water leak catch pan underneath the um, clothes washer. And there wasn't a water leak catch pan underneath the hot water tank as well. And the garage. Garage for me is a system or a room. So I group everything in the garage. I group garages together. Uh, carports, I leave those on for the exterior. It's like a, an exterior uh, sub part of an exterior. Test the garage door openers, open and close them. We have a course on inspecting your garage, garage door openers, testing them. And then I take a look at the structure, GFCIs, looking for water damage. And I'm also showing that there are inspection restrictions, right? So 
not required to report everything that's visible, only things that I observe and deemed material. So there are inspection restrictions. In the kitchen, kitchen's the last part. I come into the kitchen, I'm done with my inspection, I set up my printer, and I start um, downloading and printing. I print out a summary report, and if my client wants to stay, I'll throw in a bunch of pictures into the report as fast as I can. I give myself 20 minutes, as many pictures as I can into the report, video if I can, and then I print it out if they want to. I typically just do a upload and, and so that they can download it um, whenever they want. Electronic. I'm done printing uh, full color sheets of paper, but you may still do that. And if you do that, if you print out, boy, just don't staple it together. Put it in a really nice binder. Spectre Outlet, our e-commerce partner, has that. Put a nice binder. Put a home maintenance book in there. Speaking of home maintenance books, this is a fantastic. Give every client one of these. Send this to past clients as well. Your clients will learn how, your, how their home works, how to keep it maintained, and how to save energy. It gives over a dozen reasons to hire you again as part of a routine maintenance plan. Um, give each client several of them. They'll put one on the shelf, and they have to give it away because of the value, so they won't throw it away. They'll give it to a friend. It's essentially, you put your business card here, or business sticker there, essentially a really nice way for people to remember you. Um, and there's the sinks in the kitchen, GFCIs. There's four GFCIs that are not protected. I run a short cycle. I turn on the gas burners. I hold the oven door, I turn on the oven, and I don't let go of the oven. Because you never want to let the oven go and then leave the house. So never let that oven door go until you turn it off. And then I also do video of my inspections. And this is part of my brand. So I was the inspector who did a ton of photographs. I shared all those photographs with my clients and also did a video uh, of the roof at least of the roof, if my client wasn't there, or if my client was in California somewhere, um, I would do a video of the entire inspection, or at least just the defects. So um, I would shoot this video while I'm inspecting, and then I'd come down to the kitchen, the last system or room of my inspection, I'd put in the video, I'd hit play, and I'd turn my laptop around, and I'd ask my client and their real estate agent to watch the video, and I wouldn't tell them what they're watching until they realize, oh, that's their roof. It's just another reason that they hired the right inspector. Really confirm it, really drive it in. So here's an inspection report. Uh, taking a look, anything immediate? Um, no, I'm looking at, looking at some questions. We're doing good. Make sure you uh, take advantage of that 50% uh, off discount off your membership for non-members. Okay. Um, and also, you might be interested in this at that URL, what underscore really underscore matters. And, and it's a video about what really matters during a home inspection. Kind of sets your client's expectations up. And you could visit that URL, copy and then paste the embed code into your website. Here's something I like to share also. Um, it's a page that describes um, a scope of the inspection. And it says, um, the inspection is based on observation of the visible, readily accessible, and apparent condition of the structure and components on this day. The results of this inspection are not intended to make any representation regarding the presence or absence of latent or concealed defects that are not reasonably ascertainable or readily accessible in a competently performed home inspection. So that's basically saying there's a lot of things that I'm going to inspect. I'm not required to inspect everything. I'm required to report to you material defects that I observe and deemed material. Not. I'm not going to debate whether this was visible now or then, or, and um, I'm not going to debate uh, about um, what was observed and what wasn't. I'm required to report the things that I observe and deem the material. 
And my inspection report. There's um, a lot of pictures of the roof. Everything is basically in good shape, but the kickoff flashing. So I have pictures of the kickoff flashing and the water damage and explanation of that defect. And then there's the exterior components, and I break it down. Um, there's the exterior system, and then I talk about surface water management, sump pump pipe, window wells, house wall coverings, I identify them. On the next page, driveway and parking, walks, patio, porch, steps and handrails, exterior water faucets, receptacles, public gas meter. Next page, dryer vent hood, which is a problem, lights, and then I go to the heating system. So I inspect in a certain way, system by system, room by room, system and then components, taking pictures, taking videos, and then that is just reflected in my inspection report. In my inspection reports, I start with systems and I break it down into components. And as you can tell, every component has a picture. And if there's a problem, then I take a lot of pictures of that problem and I stick it in the report. So we have the plumbing, there's the missing, there's a pressure problem, the missing expansion tank with a check valve and the leaking pressure relief valve. There's the electrical panel. There's the structure. Everything's great except the major water damage on the floor components, structural components caused by the kickoff flashing at the roof. There's the garage. There's the laundry. There's the attic space. There's the bathrooms, kitchens, missing GFCIs, the interior. And then I have a, a, um, a comment about mold, if I'm not doing a mold inspection. I'll at least comment about it. Indications conducive, uh, conducive um, to mold growth. Conditions conducive to mold growth. And we also have a textbook about how to perform a mold inspection. We also have an online certification, training and certification course about performing a, a mold inspection. We actually have a lot of cool things, um, like this field guide to insects, wood destroying insects. Because as you know, um, if you have water intrusion and water damage coming into the home, you probably have an invitation, an, invi an open invitation to um, water destroying insects. They, like carpenter ants, love wet wood to chew into. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, um, InterNACHI has, tech these aren't all of them, there's a big check section of them, a chunk of them, um, textbooks that come with our courses, and here's here's a really good one, Structural Issues. There's a course, and this is the companion textbook that comes with it. So there's that. Don't mean to go off on a tangent. Um, another thing that I do is I comment that my client was or was not with me, especially if they were not. And I tell them that they have made a mistake not being with me because we could have um, seeing things together as they appeared during the inspection, at the time of the inspection, and I could have answered all of your questions, but you weren't here. So there was another inspection restriction, not just the stuff, the personal items in the house that's occupied, but my client not being with me is actually an inspection restriction, and I tell them why. Also, I have um, some statements about um, up here, you can use these narratives if you want, disclaimers. Um, we may not have tested every outlet and opened every window and door or identified every problem because our inspection is essentially visual. Latent defects could exist. We can't see behind walls. Plain language. Therefore, you should not regard our inspection as a guarantee or warranty. It's simply a report of the general condition of a property given at a point in time. As a homeowner, you should expect problems occur. Problems to occur. Roofs leak. Basements may have water problems, and systems may fail without warning. We cannot predict future conditions. So, set your clients up with the right expectations of what you do during an inspection. Well, I actually prepared to do another home inspection with you all, but we are out of time. We have one minute left. 
So I want to leave you with um, me. My name. My name is Ben Gromyko. I'm from InterNACHI. For signing up for future classes, go to that URL, nachi.org forward slash webinar. And make sure you get the step-by-step -step checklist for running a successful home inspection business at the next URL, nachi.org forward slash everything. Everything you need all in one place. And make sure also, if you're a non-member, that you have taken advantage of the offer that we've made on the right side of your screen if you're attending the live class. A 50% discount off your first year membership. And that's about it. So thank you so much for attending our live home inspection training class number 10. And um, I'll see you all later. Bye.